So uh, my first story um, has to do with the Hubble legacy field, legacy field. And this is something uh, that was in the news um, quite a bit. So many of you have probably heard about this. Uh, but what it uh, basically is, is um, the Hubble Space Telescope staring into a part of the sky uh, for a really long time and actually um, having um, multiple um, observations. So not just um, one observation, but in this case, over 7,500 observations. And, um, and this is actually a pretty significant part of the sky. It's in the southern part of the sky. And it's a region that um, is almost the size of the full moon. So the full moon subtends um, 30 arc minutes. So if you think about um, a circle all around you, and you divide that circle into 360 degrees, and each of those degrees um, is divided into 60 arc minutes. Well, when you look at the full moon in the sky, it's um, about half a degree. So it, um, it's not a very big part, part of the sky. But um, the Hubble Space Telescope actually observes an even smaller uh, patch normally. And so this is composed of many thousands of observations, um, 7,500 um, total observations in multiple wavelength um, bands. And <clears throat> this isn't the first time that Hubble has stared at a part of the sky for a long time. The, um, the very first um, time that it happened um, was um, over 20 years ago in um, what is known as the Hubble Deep Field. And so this is um, using a camera that is no longer on board um, Hubble. This is the Wide Field um, Planetary Camera 2. It has this very um, strange looking, um, kind of distinctive um, shape. So this is one camera. And what um, they did was to observe a single patch of sky um, in the constellation of Ursa Ma uh, Major, which is the Big Bear, or we think of it as the Big Dipper. And uh, they observed for about 10 days um, straight. Hubble, um, the Hubble telescope um, orbits the Earth um, once about 90 minutes. So that means it couldn't actually um, lock on and observe that whole time. Although um, this was actually um, towards um, the North um, Celestial Pole. So it was actually in, in a region where it was visible the whole time. But uh, periodically, Hubble would have to um, end the observation because uh, the detector uh, was basically filling up. There's um, so much charge that it could hold. Um, you don't want to overexpose um, the image. And then um, it would reobserve. And then also period periodically, um, it would um, also need to beam back the data uh, back, to, um, back to the ground. And so what um, astronomers do is that they take multiple observations, and then they can combine them together into a computer. And in this case, um, what you get after you combine it is an image that has over 3,000 galaxies. And there's only a handful or a couple handfuls of actual stars. So there's one star here, and there's one star there, and there's a star here. And you can tell the stars because um, stars have these um, what are known as diffraction spikes. Stars um, are point-like even with the Hubble Space Telescope, but the, um, the optics um, with the light going through, uh, bouncing off multiple mirrors, um, it can um, cause the spikes to appear for point -like op bright point-like objects. But um, from what I understand, there's only about 20 stars total in this image. And basically, everything else in this picture, all the um, faint little fuzzy spots, and even things that um, don't even look like um, they should be anything, there's just a, a fuzzy patch, those are actually galaxies. So you know, our Milky Way galaxy is home to a couple hundred billion stars, including our sun. And every single um, fuzzy patch in this picture is a distinct galaxy. And if you think about what um, the Hubble Space Telescope is seeing, what's going on is that it's staring at a tiny patch of sky. And so when um, it's looking at galaxies that are along this pencil beam that stretches out into space. And so you can see galaxies that are relatively close by like these larger ones. Um, and then, of course, the, um, the stars are in, in our galaxy. They're, they're very close. They're much closer than any of these other galaxies. But as you um, look at fainter and fainter objects, um, you're looking at things that are further and further away. And because the speed of light is finite, meaning it takes 186,000, um, or it travels 186,000 miles uh, for every second uh, of light travel time, um, as you um, look further and further away, you're actually also looking further into the past. 
And so what these types of surveys allow us to do is they allow us to sample the universe along this pencil beam and we're seeing things that are closer and, um, to us in space and also closer in time um, for the nearby objects. But as we look at further and further away objects, we're seeing things further away and they're also more distant in time. And so they represent objects that are um, at an earlier stage of evolution in the universe. We're looking at galaxies um, that haven't evolved as much as the current galaxies. And so these sort of surveys allow us to understand how galaxies and the universe has changed over the history of the universe, over the 13.7 billion year history of our universe. So this was the very first Hubble Deep Field. And um, there have been other ones um, that have come um, since then. So there's one um, called the Great Observatories Origins Deep Survey, also known as GOODS. Um, and this started in 2003, but it continued over many years. Um, this is called the Great Observatories because not only did it use uh, the Hubble telescope, but it also used the Spitzer Space Telescope, which observed um, in the infrared, as well as the, um, the Chandra Space Telescope, which observes in x-rays. Um, and then later on, there, um, there, there was also the ultra, Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And in this case, um, they looked at um, a patch of sky um, and found, um, I think, on the order of about 10,000 um, galaxies. And this, um, you know, the, Hubble, um, the first Hubble Deep Field took um, 10 days. This um, took over 100 days worth of observations. And then um, the, uh, there was also um, this um, extreme deep field is um, a smaller um, patch of the, um, the ultra deep field. And so um, they um, basically took, I, I was trying to see if I could identify galaxies that were common um, to the two of them, but um, I shouldn't try that on stage here. But um, so, so, so what they did was they zoomed in to a, um, a smaller portion of the, um, the ultra deep field and then um, stared at it. Um, and in this case, they found um, over 5,000 galaxies. So, you know, and so what we're seeing are basically different pencil beams. You know, some are very narrow pen pencil beams. Others are fatter uh, pencils, like the contractor pencils you might see at Home Depot. Uh, but they're all um, ways of... Um, ways of observing um, one patch of sky, allowing us to see um, the universe going back in time and also going back into space. So that brings us to the Hubble Legacy Field. And what this is, is um, it basically covers the same areas that we've seen before. Um, it doesn't cover the original Hubble Deep Field because that was in the Northern Hemisphere towards um, the Big Dipper. Um, these fields are in the southern part of the sky. So uh, these are, this is part of the, the sky that we can't see from Denver, but that's not a problem for the Hubble Space Telescope. So you can see um, here is the extreme deep field, that smaller um, region uh, that we last saw. Here's the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, slightly larger. And then here's the Goods region, which is much larger still. And then the Hubble Legacy Field. And so what the Hubble Legacy Field people did was actually they took all the observations that had come before. Um, so people have been observing this region for the extreme deep field, the Hubble ultra deep field, as well as the Goods field. And um, other um, astronomers have proposed um, research observations with Hubble to, um, to cover other regions, um, patches that are close close by, and then what the legacy people did was to take all this prior data and combined with um, new observations that they undertook on their own to um, come up with a cumulative um, Hubble legacy field. So the Hubble legacy field actually consists of observations that go back 16 years, all the way to the goods field from 2003. And this um, image uh, compilation um, shows you how um, the coverage of the legacy field um, in different wavelength bands. And so uh, this is kind of confusing because what we're, uh, these letters and numbers represent the names of um, the, um, the filters used up on, on board the Hubble Space Telescope. And so what the Hubble does is it will place a particular filter to extract out light of a particular color um, and then do the observation and then it'll switch filters and then um, take observations um, with, um, in a completely different color. So 606 represents uh, 606 nanometers, which is in the red, 
And then as we go um, to 775, 814, 850, those go further and further into the red. And we're into kind of the, um, the near infrared now, um, 125, uh, this is 1,250 um, uh, nanometers, 1,400 nanometers, 1,600 nanometers. And then going in the other, other direction, we're going into the yellows and blues and into the ultraviolet. And so you can see that the, the coverage isn't uniform. You know, the, um, the greatest coverage is in um, the red, the 606. And then depending on um, what particular color they're um, looking at, they either have you know, less coverage here, but greater coverage here and here, and also less coverage in some of the, um, the ultraviolet um, filters. Here is um, a, a similar picture, but um, the, um, the brightness in these patches represent how much exposure time um, was spent. And so um, this is the, um, the Hubble um, ultra deep field, that bright um, square that shows up. Um, and so you can see that um, they were taking advantage of data where um, they, they had already collected a lot of information, a lot of data um, from the Hubble ultra deep field. But in some cases, um, like here, um, there isn't um, a, the, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field just because the Hubble Ultra Deep Field didn't observe at that particular wavelength. And finally, this is a breakdown um, of how the observations were made over time. And so again, we see um, each of these small squares represents um, the different filters or the different colors, but then um, w uh, these, um, each of these epochs represent a time period. And it, um, this text is really small, so I'll just read out. This is from 2002, May to um, April of 2003. And so each, each of these um, epochs represents uh, multiple months worth of observations. And so you can tell um, how all this came about through a patchy series of observations that uh, took place over 16 years, basically. And then at the beginning, they were able to take advantage of the goods observations. So the goods um, managed to observe quite a bit of sky, but then um, you know, we see that um, they gradually filled in all the way until um, roughly about um, just a couple years ago. So the last observations were done in 2016. All right, so um, what does the, um, the Hubble legacy field um, look like when you um, observe it um, or look at it at the highest resolution. You can actually go um, to the NASA website. Um, you can Google Hubble Legacy Field, and you can download a full-scale resolution version of this. It's about 27,000 pixels across by, um, I think, like 19,000 pixels. So uh, that original picture that I showed is, um, is basically been um, scaled down to fit the screen. And here I've just selected um, small patches and um, to show at the full resolution. And so here we have a star that's just off um, the edge that I've clipped off, and you can see that diffraction spike. But um, again, um, every single one of these um, blobs is a galaxy, and even some of the really tiny faint specks, those are um, entire galaxies that are so far away that we only see them as faint specks. The, um, <coughs> the galaxies that we see in the legacy field date back to about um, five or 600 million years after the Big Bang. So we're um, really seeing um, galaxies from today all the way you know, to uh, as close to the beginning of the universe as um, possible. And the astronomers involved with this project basically say that um, you know, we won't be getting a, a more impressive deep field from Hubble anytime you know, after this. Um, we'll have to wait for uh, the successor telescopes to Hubble like the James Webb um, Space Telescope or the Wide Field um, the, the Surveyor, um, just because um, you know, the, um, Hubble is kind of at, at the end of its life and there are no programs that are expected to have um, as many observations as we have for this legacy field. And um, so there are galaxies that we're familiar with, like um, spiral galaxies, but um, you also see galaxies that, um, that seem to be interacting. So here's one galaxy and then here's another galaxy and you can see there seems to be traces of gas that um, interact um, or um, connect the two of them. And we'll see uh, more of this um, throughout tonight, the fact that galaxies aren't just um, stationary by themselves, but they um, often um, can collide, they merge, they interact with other galaxies, all due to gravity. 
Um, and uh, some of them even have weird shapes. This looks kind of um, like a banana that's been twisted. And that, um, you know, I, I don't know anything about these galaxies, but just by looking at it, I, I would hazard a guess that this has had an interaction with a smaller galaxy in the recent past, meaning in the last, you know, several hundred million to uh, billion years, and that has caused a warp in the, uh, in the shape of that um, galaxy disk. And if we look at another um, portion of the legacy field, again, you have a lot of galaxies that seem uh, like they're um, hanging out by themselves. But um, there are also ones like this one that looks, again, kind of distorted. It looks kind of even rectangular, and you can sort of see like a tail that's coming out. So that, again, suggests to me, without knowing anything about this galaxy, um, it's probably uh, been, uh, it's probably had, had an inter interaction at some point in its recent past. And then here um, are some more. And then, Obviously, yeah, a problem when you're looking at um, galaxies like this is that um, there's no absolute way, you know, just by looking at this image, to know whether something is right next to each other or whether something is actually uh, separated by some distance and they look like they're close to each other just because they're superimposed. So without knowing anything, um, you know, these might be um, galaxies that just happen to be side by side because um, they're in the same direction. But I would hazard a guess that because they're roughly the same size, and you also see this kind of connecting bridge of gas, that they are um, interacting. But um, this galaxy here looks a lot further away than the, these two and these two. So I would hazard a guess that that's much further away. But um, you would have to have follow-up observations to look at the um, light from these stars from these galaxies to carefully figure out whether um, they were close together or whether they're separated. Um, by some distance apart. And then finally, here's some more um, galaxies in another um, region. And again, you see some odd shapes, galaxies that don't look completely symmetric, like this one here and these. So again, hinting at um, some kind of disruption from a close um, pass by another galaxy. And um, <clears throat> so the, um, the astronomers involved with this project have done some initial follow-up work. And so they um, show you, um, in this picture, just um, a number of different galaxies, um, all at different ages. And so in this case, um, or, or distances. Um, so BLY means billions of light years. And so this one is 0.55 billion light years away. So that means the light from this galaxy has taken 550 million years, half a billion years, to travel to us. This one has taken 2.7 billion years. It's 2.7 billion light years away. And so as we go um, further um, to larger and larger numbers, we're looking at galaxies that are further away, but they're also further back in time, or they represent an earlier epoch um, in our universe. So these galaxies here um, are, and just because of the way that um, we see things distorted um, within an expanding universe, it turns out that there isn't actually that much of a size scale change as you go after a certain distance that, um, that you're looking at. So, um, so the fact that these galaxies um, seem smaller, there is a substantial portion of that due to the fact that they are smaller. So we know from pictures like this that galaxies do grow over time. They're, they appear smaller in the past. They get bigger um, as you get closer to the present. And since we see lots of evidence of um, mergers um, and distortions that cause um, changes in the shape of these galaxies, make um, look, them look very irregular, this suggests that um, mergers um, happen throughout the history of the universe. And that is how galaxies grow. 